So, hello, Hi. and welcome to the Collective Reset Podcast, where we gather to discuss our lives, our passions, self-care, and how we are handling this worldwide reset. So can you share who you are and where you are calling from? I am Taylor Walker Sinning. I am from Miami, Florida, where we met. <laughs> yes, we do. Well, not originally. We're both from New York, but we met in Miami. That's right. Where are you from in New York, Taylor? I am a Long Island girl, born and raised. As I take a sip of my oat milk. <laughs> and you just moved back to Miami from where? Yes, we were living in the Bay Area. We lived there for about a year and a half. Um, once the pandemic happened, we knew that we wanted to move back to the East Coast to be closer to our families. That kind of expedited things. So we found ourselves back in the Miami, Miami area around June. Awesome. I'm so happy that you're back in Miami. It just you gives too. me another place to see you. <laughs> so we used to teach together. This is how we met. So we used to teach together. You were teaching what? I was teaching bar. You were teaching bar. I was at the time teaching yoga and I was working as a manager of the studio. And I absolutely fell in love with you and just thought you were so fun to watch. Your energy is so amazing. And we fell in love there. And you shared with me that you were prego. Yes. And you were I, the very first person I ever told. I was life, so I was excited. <laughs> I was standing at the desk, like doing work and you came over and told me, and I was like, so thrilled when we were standing among like all these people, mm -hmm. I was just like, okay, I'm going to keep this a secret, but this is like the best secret ever. <laughs> and then I became your doula. Mm -hmm. And so I want to talk about your birth story. Fantastic. So let's just talk about why did you decide that you even wanted to have a doula? Well, I think, you know, even when we first met, I just felt so drawn to you. And, and in that first conversation, you know, I had known that you were a doula and the owner of the studio as well had used a doula for her birth. So I just, you know, before uh, pregnancy, I never really thought about it. But I think a lot of the things that women don't talk about is, is their birth story, to be honest. You hear all of the horror stories, but uh, a main theme in people that had consistent happy birth stories were those that had doulas. And that's where once we met and um, we started to talk a little further and you just gave me such great guidance in that very first conversation from tea to rest to, you know, me, I'm always go, 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 high energy. And it was like, I just felt very nurtured, even in that short conversation. And I think that was kind of the tipping point for me to say, hey, I want the support. Like, this is new experience for me. Um, and how do we make this the best experience possible? I loved your birth. Like, I love all the babies that I helped transition <laughs> Earthside, but it was really such a beautiful experience. And there's a few things that I want to mention before we even go into your birth story. One is that this is not a podcast because I'm trying to say that this is the only way to birth, right? Like, bringing your baby Earthside is your your amazing role that you are stepping into and however your baby arrives safe and healthy is what we are always rooting for. I also never say that like this is natural birth um, because to me it makes it seem as though the other way is unnatural. Um, and I want this to not be that if you birthed a different way that there was something wrong with that way. Uh, mm -hmm. We are simply sharing what was an incredible story and hopefully in this time of women who are home pregnant um, home with babies that this brings some peace um, and that we give some helpful tips and tools on what worked for you so I would love to hear and I'm sure our audience would love to hear what your birth story was what it was for you sure so I want to kind of go back I think to the very very beginning and I'll try to keep this kind of short short long-winded <laughs> we have time but but even so it's it's i think it starts with your partner and getting your partner on board so when my husband first found out you know he is in the medical device field and just went to israel which is a big medical um community and incubator for med devices and anyone he talked to was like oh just tell her to get a c-section it's so much easier like just men telling yeah, my husband to go get a c-section so i said listen i met 
Ayana, I met Vivian Keeler, who owns Amazing Birth and Beyond. Let's just look into what she has to offer, because I know there's a better way to birth than just say, hey, cut me open. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, like you just said, it's like, get your baby out into the world safely in a way that you're comfortable. There is no right or wrong answer here, but I knew that there were options. So, you know, after having the conversation and I took him to our very first hypnobirthing class, um, he was like game changer. This, this yeah. is how we need to bring our baby into this world. Next step was doula speed dating, yeah. where I have to say, Ayana was our very, very last um, doula that we met. Corey was not impressed. <laughs> He's a very tough nut to crack until you sat down in the chair. And, you know, it's, it's, it's human life that we're taking into, um, our hands and he's very Virgo-esque. So he's very analytical. Yeah. He has like a, a vibe, like he's like, I just need to connect with that person. And, um, and once he sat down, he's like, she's our girl. There's no question about it. It was just your energy worked with us. And uh, we knew from the moment, A, that I met you, then B, once he sat down with you as well, you were just our person. Um, and there's so many wonderful doulas out there, but if you are looking for someone, I would say, make sure that personality fits your personality. I think I think it's very important yeah. um, to feel safe and to have the communication go the way that you want it to go. Yeah. Um, so the day that I went into labor, I woke up the morning, I was a little bit nauseous. Uh, we went to have bagels and I just, my mom kind of had an idea. She's like, just, I think we need to go to the, go in the water. You need to go for a swim today to see how you feel. So as the day progressed, I felt a little bit better, but I just swam in the ocean and just let my body relax. And then by the time we got home, I got in the pool and different contractions started. They were just different from the Bracton Hicks. It wasn't more belly. It was more, they felt like more like period cramps. So I was like, okay, this is different. So that's when I reached out to you. And you said, okay, just keep me posted. We downloaded our app and uh, Corey started keeping track. We ate dinner, went to sleep by 10 o'clock. I was like, nope can't lay here anymore, but they were too scattered and all over the place. So literally <laughs> you had told Corey, just tell her to relax and you still have time. They're too all over the place. So I was like, I'm going to trust this, but I'm in pain. Like I, <laughs> so I'm going to go downstairs. I labored by myself for two and a half hours, um, watching sex in the city. But because I did the hypnobirthing classes, because we had our meetings, like I wasn't scared. Yeah. And I think that was so important because we knew the time frame. We knew that it, how they would feel when they became more consistent. I was like, listen, Corey, my mom, you guys sleep when I need you, I'll be there. You know, let's so, talk for a second. I just want to interrupt you for a second. Hypnobirthing. So what are you learning in these classes? So really we were learning about the birthing process and what happens, but then the Mongan method of hypnobirthing, which was like really exciting to try, um, is basically a breathing technique. You know, it's not so much someone's going to lull you and, and, and hypnotize you, but it's really forcing your body to go into the most relaxed state and how you get there. So utilizing your breath, utilizing tracks, there was like a rainbow relaxation track and then a mantra track. Um, we practiced that, that every night from like month five on. So I would do it once during the day and then Corey and I would do it together at night. So then by the time labor happened, it, that it was, it was game on my tracks my ear pods went in, the track started, and literally I just went into this state of like, let my body do its thing. And again, from those classes, it was like, I felt supported so that once everything revved up and Corey kind of jumped into action there, I did get sick. I knew it was going to go one way or the other. I wasn't scared. We went bath, shower, bath, shower. And then by the point where they were pretty consistent, you were here, my warrior goddess that I needed. <laughs> my life I think that was like 3 45 in the morning so yeah contractions mildly started at 5 30 but by 3 45 we were headed out to the hospital so I think this was like and I still I just have such vivid memory of you putting my clothes on number one number two pressing my hips and swaying yeah. and it was this like and because I'm a dancer too and you're a yogi so you know movement is just it was just like we were swaying together and it was just so beautiful. Like I yeah. forget the pain. I forget the discomfort. I trusted in my body. There was no, I wasn't scared. And I just, I want to keep reiterating that because yeah. I think knowledge and preparation leads to peaceful birth, no matter how you get there. Yeah. Um, and 
things happen, right? I, I didn't know if my body could do this. I also didn't know if hypnobirthing would actually work because what do we see in, on, on TV and in the movies, women screaming. And I didn't know that it could be this peaceful or you don't really believe your body could do this until it actually does. Um, so we went to the hospital and what felt like a 10 minute drive was actually a 35 minute drive to the hospital. Um, we got there and I was about six centimeters dilated by the time we got there. And I think the nurses were like, why does she have these headphones on? I had eye mask, headphones, in the zone, breathing. I have pictures of all of them giving thumbs up. I want to like <laughs> just mention like one of the funniest, it's why like your birth story I find so hilarious is because one, it was the most peaceful birth I've ever attended. Like we're a mother, you stopped talking at your house when we left. <laughs> like we were upstairs in your bathroom. It was 3.45. It was like, okay, we've been here a little bit. We need to go. And you went in one car with your husband and I was behind you in my car. By the time we got to the waiting room and the waiting room, what people sometimes don't realize is you really wait. And there is a lot of like paperwork and, oh. and insurance. It's just, it's a long process. And so we're all in the waiting room and luckily there was maybe another family there, but I don't really remember. And they put you into a wheelchair. We're sitting in the hallway <laughs> and it's like you, Corey, me, your mom, and everyone's got like all your stuff and you are eye mask. It's like a million nurses, lights, like it's loud. You have eye mask, headphones, blanket, and like never looked up. And it was just nope. like, and maybe someone would tap you, but you would just like open your eyes and it was like, okay. And then back into your zone and everything was just going on around it, you. And it felt like you never lifted your head. And it was in the zone. most beautiful way. Yeah. Right. I think, I think it was, and, and that's something that was mentioned in class. It was like a way to work with your body where I was like, I need to be here. It was, it was a feeling of being fully present, which yeah. I feel like doesn't happen often. And I really had to focus on my breath to ride every wave the, the way that it needed to. I mean, I remember being, when they first laid me on the table, you know, they weren't expecting me to be that far along. You know, I remember even the nurses dialogue back and yeah. forth because I was so Everyone you know, focused. Was very surprised yeah yes yeah and and I you know I think that comes from having a fitness background too which you know when the things get intense that's where I did a lot of my practice I would visualize where I would be I would be in the clouds or I would be in like the the countryside of Tuscany under this like olive tree like this is where I would I would put myself during those hard classes to prepare myself for this moment and mm -hmm. if you trust in your body and you and you actually practice it it's amazing <laughs> what the mind can do over the discomfort. So once we got to the room, I think the hardest part for me was really having that monitor around my belly. I just did not yeah. want it. Um, and then the peanut ball came out. <laughs> Which, the peanuts, the my moment. best friend. I love it. I love it. If people don't know what the peanut is, it looks like a big foam peanut and it's used um, to help women allow their cervix to open and their pelvic floor to soften. And so you put it between their legs as they lay on the side. And most mothers, I mean, they don't want it. It's at the end. It's like the last thing you want is someone like spreading your legs and, mm -hmm. and making you turn. I turn you like a rotisserie chicken, which yep. moms are usually pretty angry about. <laughs> um, but it helps. But the best part about it is you rubbed me down before we did it. You like prepped yeah. me like I was a boxer getting ready for, which I was. It was the biggest event of my life. She whipped out the oil. She was like, okay, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to put you on this ball. And, and what's so great is that my friend told me right before the baby comes, I'll probably start shaking and, yeah. and violently shaking. So when that happened, I wasn't scared. It was like that moment where we all worked together. To, I mean, that breath was like, <laughs> it was deep. <laughs> because the shaking came and the breathing got deeper, but then I was ready to meet my baby. You know, my water broke naturally when, um, right before you put me on the peanut ball, which was wonderful. And, and then we got in the tub and I, I mean, a half hour later, maybe. Yeah. It was so quick. We got you in the water and there was a lot of just swaying and breathing and the lights were off and mm -hmm. Corey was here and I was here and you're amazing doctor. Um, mm -hmm. And it felt like, 
you know, it was what I also want to mention about that is sometimes I think people feel like you have to be home in order to have a water yes. birth, birth or a doula. And you were in a hospital and mm-hmm. we were in a hospital room and it still was lights off. And mm-hmm. I mean, no one was speaking and we, it was a very collective, just sending energy your way. And you, I felt like you pushed three times. Yeah, it um, was very, yeah. Yeah, and I feel like you were able to get me to that point where I didn't have to then get in the water for another hour. It was like, okay, yeah. you told me, you said, we're gonna get through this. Like, this is going to be the hardest part. And then we were, I was like, okay, I'm ready. And even, you know, the midwife, she, she said, I am here when you need me, okay? Yeah. When you're ready to push, I'm going to be right here. So I never yeah. felt, and I think that's such an important conversation to have too when you're trying to find your doctor Mm-hmm. is finding a, a doctor if you are going to have it in a hospital setting that is going to be supportive of the way that you want to birth. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why, I mean, that's a big reason we moved back to Florida is because I yeah. wanted to go back to Serene Health and have, like you said, I was in a hospital. I was able to have a water birth. I had my mantras up on the, yeah. <laughs> on the side of the tub. And, and it was kind of that best of both worlds experience. And I have nothing but um, happiness and joy from that moment and and through the golden hour after which they allowed too it was like there were so many things that I had no idea from vaccines they get right away to ointment to things that can disrupt the breastfeeding experience and to be able to have both experiences on my terms was fantastic and I couldn't have done that without you we couldn't have done it without you it was all you it was all (laughs) you it really wasn't you know I think something you said is really important, which is it's the practice that goes into it. And it's something that I always say as like a prenatal yoga teacher or as a doula is like, it will become automatic to a point if you Mm -hmm. train your mind, your body and your breath beforehand. What What is silly is to expect to be able to enter into that zone without having put in serious time. Yeah. And just like you said, I rubbed you down like a boxer. Like you have to look at it as like you're training for an event. It is a Mm -hmm. major body energetic event. And if you train yourself for it, your body will then know what to do. And then you can enjoy the experience Mm -hmm. rather than battling it or fighting it or trying to figure it out in the midst of it, which is too much. It's too much and it's overwhelming for so many moms. And that's how we've heard how many experiences of the women in your life. Have you heard these, these war stories over, you know, my story is very um, uncommon, you know, although I mean, I don't know how many women do birth this way. It's not the most common scenario or the most common story, but yeah, I trained anything you told me to do. I would pictures of raspberry leaf tea. I ate six dates a day. I did the hypnobirthing tracks. You know, I had my brothers laughing at me with my hypnobirthing no birthing book, you know, and, and, but that I said, this is my background. This is my field. This is what I love to do. And this is how I choose to birth. I was like, Mm -hmm. you don't have to do that, but this is what I want from my experience. And thankfully, you know, we were able to do it because I know so many people set out to have a similar experience and unfortunately don't get this. Um, but you know, birthing can be so beautiful, but you do have to work for it. And that is like, You know, it's really a shame what women are raised to believe about birth from Mm -hmm. just thinking about movies. I mean, the fact that like your water breaks as soon as you have a contraction and then they race you to the hospital (laughs) and everyone's yelling and the woman screams and this, I mean, it's like, it's horrifying. And then I think as women, we have to take responsibility for we share our horror stories. we share them larger than we share our, our beautiful stories Mm -hmm. and our happy stories. I think that there's also generation to generation. I think that we've sometimes allowed our older generations to tell us like, you don't need to do all that stuff. Mm -hmm. That's silly. We've been doing this for years. Yes. Women have, right. You can sit in your backyard and squat Mm -hmm. and have a baby. Like Mm -hmm. your body's going to do it regardless but you can cultivate and design the experience that you want to have. And, Absolutely. And you don't have to have your grandma's experience 
No. And I think that was like, a, like after, you know, you've met my mom and she was there with yeah. us and she was like, I wouldn't, she's like, I don't even know what to say. She's like, if, if I didn't see what just happened, yeah. she was like, I don't know if I would even believe it. You yeah. know, she was knocked out cold with almost all of us. So, um, you know, to see in one generation, how vastly different our experiences are. It, it, it just speaks volumes about what you can do and the control you can take over your birth. And I, I just, I empower every woman to just know your options. Doesn't matter what you choose, just know your options so that when that day comes, you're not scared. Yeah. I think that was the biggest takeaway for me is I never felt scared. I think something else to note is when we think about the mortality rates of women in childbirth in hospitals, when we think of the disparity between white women and black women who birth in hospitals, I think it's important to have an advocate. And mm -hmm. why I find doula so vital is the truth is that your partner wants to focus on you and they are also terrified, right? Like there's no training book for the emotions that might come with it. And the fact that you might be scared, right? You're about to be a dad or a mom and, or a partner, and that's all terrifying. Your mother or the adult, adult, I guess we, mm -hmm. I forget sometimes <laughs> that I'm 40, right? Um, are the caregiver that goes with you. They wanna be able to focus on you. What no yeah. one wants to have to do is also manage the the doctors, their questions, if something were to need more attention, to have somebody standing there that is hearing what the doctor's saying with a clear head and that has seen so many other births that they know what is quote unquote normal, what mm -hmm. is to be expected, what you can avoid because this is to benefit the hospital and the doctor and it's not necessary for you. Um, I think that's also why doulas become so important. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, that there were so many moments, I feel like without you, it was just from when the lights were blinding, when I couldn't have that, I didn't want the monitor on anymore. You stepped in and said, hey, like, can we take this off? When can we take this off? And you, you know, you gave me that support. Then, you know, there was one nurse who was at the end of her shift and like, we were like, got her out of there, oh, you yeah. know. I remember oh, her. <laughs> I mean, it was to the point where I looked up from the water and said, are you serious? Right before my final push or whatever. But Because um, that's that also bridge. what happens, right? Is you're mm -hmm. managing personalities. And sometimes you get mm -hmm. staff that has worked 13 hours and yep. they don't care that you're in labor. And they mm -hmm. say very inappropriate things. Mm -hmm. And you need a doula to kindly escort them out <laughs> of your energetic space. Yes. Um, something else I'd like to touch on is just... I find that for women, and I've seen this with the women I've been lucky enough to assist in birth, is that your birth thereby can affect your own confidence after how mm -hmm. you feel in what I call that fourth trimester, um, your relationship with the people who are with you. And, and, and so I'm wondering how your birth story you feel like affected how you your confidence level or how you felt afterwards? Yeah. So <clears throat> I think, I think it's, it was kind of a double-edged sword. I have to yeah. be honest because pregnancy for me was great. Didn't have any morning sickness that go around. Um, our birth was like, you, you couldn't script it. I mean, it was so beautiful. And then I got home, my recovery, I, you know, there was barely any tearing. I, he fed right away. It was like, I was like, motherhood's gonna be no joke and then two weeks hit he started to wake up my support system left my husband started going back to work my postpartum anxiety kicked in by the time I saw you I think a few weeks later it was just like you know for that second time I was unraveling yeah. so I think it was it was a lot tougher for me because you know all the stories I heard were like you know, what we see on social media and it's so beautiful and you're in love with your baby right away. And I was surviving. Yeah. So I don't think I expected, um, the pressure and the emotion afterwards, considering like everything came so textbook and relatively, I don't want to say easy because it was not easy, <laughs> but, um, you know, it was, it was definitely that shock. And because, 
you know, we, he was such an alert newborn as well. I think from having that, you know, drug free birth, um, that, that kind of threw me for a loop a little bit. <laughs> what else do you feel like in that fourth? So the fourth trimester is what I call like, mm -hmm. you know, those three months that happen after you deliver. Um, and there is, I think so much change in the body physically, mentally, emotionally. I think, you know, we hear about postpartum as part of the conversation, but I think there's also mm -hmm. so many little things that people just don't share with other women. Um, yeah, what are some of the things that you felt like, wow, I wish somebody had said this or. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny because my brother just had, <clears throat> and his wife just had a baby, um, you know, less than five weeks ago, six weeks ago. And um, we were just having this conversation last night. He's like, I had you at Houston's when the baby was three weeks old. Like, what was I thinking? He's like, you don't know what this is like until you go through it. Like no one tells you. I said, people try, but you can't understand it until you go through it. And I think, I think postpartum anxiety for me was really a shock. Um, the feeling of being out of control because I'm so used to trying to control things. Um, so, and also mourning the life that you had prior to becoming a mom. I don't think that's talked about enough, especially if you're used to, you know, we traveled and I have a career and I've had all these things. And then, you know, your, your spouse's life doesn't change as much as yours does. So that's a whole transition into family and mourning the life that you had and trying to figure out, okay, what does a family of three mean now? And where do your roles kind of fall into place? So that takes a lot of work, I think, emotionally, um, you know, and of course it's, it's the physical, you know, you come home from the hospital and you still look six months pregnant, <laughs> you know, and I think as someone who's in the space of fitness, it, it is a little bit jarring, even if you only gain 25 pounds they're still you're still different um you know so I think the physicality of it but for me it was more my mental health and when we moved it was uh so from July to January I real, really struggled because we also on top of that at three months moved to the west coast so it was a huge life overhaul on top of everything so I was struggling with a lot of resentment a lot of anxiety and and I sat down and I literally wrote down like a tangible happiness plan and thank God for girlfriends is all I have to say, because your mama tribe, your tribe of like strong mothers are like the only way to get through it. It's like, you've yeah. got to use them. You and I spoke a few times. I think having that support postpartum is fantastic. You know, having a lactation support system for breastfeeding. Um, and then I just literally said, okay, I can't live my life like this. I talked to my doctor because I wanted to be screened for postpartum depression, but it just was, she, she said I was borderline, but she was like, I think this is more circumstantial versus, you know, so she was like, let's check in again in, in a couple of months. She's like, here's what you need to do, you know, try to get part of a mommy group and everything else. So I just started to think like, what is going to make me happy? So when CJ was a viable human, as I like to call him yeah. around that six month mark, it's like, I got help in the house. I started getting out. I, you know, started working out again and investing in myself, even if it was an hour, hour and a half, it was something. Yeah. Um, and then once that started to happen, the corner started to turn and I felt myself coming back to life. Um, but I think the most surprising thing was just, I love CJ. I am now obsessed with CJ, like all of a sudden. But for me, it was like, it was survival mode for like the first six to nine months. And then all of a sudden, he just flooded my heart with this like overabundance yeah. of love. And I, I don't think that's talked about enough because I think all we see and what a lot of people talk about, I'm so in love. And this, so if you are feeling like I have this creature I have to take care of, you're surviving and you're not alone. There's plenty of mamas out there that are in that same place that you fall in love with your child over time. And if you're really feeling in that dark space, go talk to someone. There's no shame in talking to someone because again, it comes, knowledge is, is power. Yeah. I love that. I think it's like one, have a tribe, find mm -hmm. a tribe. So important. I think the biggest part of that is also make a happiness plan. Like it is, yeah. you know, I think people think it's like silly to do stuff like that, which I'm always surprised about. Cause it's like, we make plans for everything else, but we don't make right. plans for our own joy, survival, self-care or happiness. Mm -hmm. And when you're going through such an incredible transition, which I also think people underestimate is, oh yeah, I feel like pregnancy has almost become so normalized. It's like, oh, well, women are supposed to have them and then you're just supposed to like move on. It's like, no, mm -hmm. 
Um, that's not what happens. And you have to, yeah, put a plan into place for it's not going to be roses. It might just be this human that's attached to your boob that you're like, this sucks right now. Mm -hmm. That's a reality. And having a plan to get you step by step back into you is just smart. Yeah. And know that it's okay to take time. And I, th I think that what people, they don't think about like the foods that they pick up or what they drink and how that also affects their happiness and the way that they're moving their body and like going to, to, to see a movie or yeah. practice self-care, all of those things feed into your happiness. So it's not a one size fits all situation for everyone. But if that, that new mother at six weeks is say, okay, check the box, go back to your regular life. Yeah. and you don't write down that tangible happiness plan and you don't fill up your cup, you're going to end up depleted and it just gets worse from there. So it, it's, you're right. We make plans for everything else. So why not? You're happy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So now you're, you're happy. You're back in Florida um, and you've landed during a pandemic and civil rights movement. And mm -hmm. so now what is pandemic life like for you back on the East coast? So as of seven weeks ago, I am an expecting mother in a <laughs> pandemic, <laughs> living in Miami, <laughs> in the midst of a civil rights movement. <laughs> First of all, congratulations. I'm Thank laughing for you. so many reasons. I'm so happy, first of all. Thank obviously you. <laughs> you know my heart is like there's little heart bombs going off i'm also just <laughs> laughing because you're my friend and i just think it's funny that you're like and now you're pregnant in a pandemic and it's still all right <laughs> and it's like da, 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 da. <laughs> and i'm also trying to figure out where eula may can be parked in may <laughs> Oh my God, it just makes me so happy. It makes me laugh. Okay. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> I love you too. So <laughs> let's talk about, okay, so then you find out you're pregnant in a pandemic, mm -hmm. which is, mm -hmm. so people are fucking scared anyway from everything. <laughs> yeah. So what's this like? So now we Amazon Prime our groceries. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's, it's like, you know, the night before we found out, actually, this is kind of crazy because you just start to, A, a we, we started shelter in place. We were the first state when we were out in the Bay Area, February, yeah. like, I was coaching at Barry's 10 classes a week. I was out every day. Like we had enough yeah. care. I was doing all these things. So once again, kind of at the height of what I was doing and then boom, forced inside, which yeah. A, on one side, it's been really fantastic because it made me kind of have a realization of how much I was missing out on. Um, and I think we fight because I think moms of our generation, we just want to be everything to everyone. And then I realized my little creature is growing up really fast. And I'm so obsessed, like I said, and in love with him. So fast forward, we get to Miami, all of a sudden, skyrockets, you know, here and people aren't wearing masks. I'm like, what the going on because we've literally been waiting in line at a grocery store for two months. Yeah. Um, and that in and itself can lead to some like, you know, PTSD type effects, you know, because you're just afraid to go anywhere or do anything. So for me, when I got here, I knew there was something off. I think as a postpartum woman, it is vital to take your health into your own hands because what happens a lot of time after that six weeks, you get your check mark and then your hair starts falling out and your boobs are really weird and your skin's really dry. But again, no one talks about these things and there is no prescription for revitalizing health postpartum. So I have a wonderful acupuncturist here, which you and I both know and love, and, and she treats me Let's with Eastern plug medicine. Her, Nancy yes. Clark of North Miami, Florida. We love Nancy Clark. Please find Nancy Clark. She is a healer among healers. Love that woman. Love that. I mean, of from getting pregnant to postpartum, like she has just been everything. And I, and I, when I literally, I landed, no, before we even flew home, I said, Nancy, I need to come see you something that's wrong with me. And I've been hesitant to go back to my traditional Western medicine doctor because everything just comes back. You're within range, take the supplement, you're fine. What she does as a functional and optimal medicine doctor, she looks at your optimal ranges and she takes a deeper dive and then treats you with herbs and whole food supplements. So you're not, you know, going on medication 
medication. And, and that's really important to me because I was like, so much can be fixed with whole foods and a good diet. And this was just like that added sprinkle. So turns out there were some issues with my T3 hormone, elevated cortisol levels, which I've had for years because we, you know, we live in America right now. I think everyone does. And then on top of that, I was actually very elevated anemia. So um, she treated me for about a month. And I mean, I went from like sloughing through life, thinking it was just pandemic, everything to literally boundless energy. And I was like, I mean, my skin was so dry, my hair, everything. I mean, she's incredible. So she is. She knew we were going to try to get pregnant. She gave me these herbs to try to get pregnant. Literally, I was pregnant with it. Like, even at that time where she was treating me for acupuncture, I had gotten pregnant during that cycle of herbs and everything else. So now we're seven weeks in, which is still early, but I know this will air in a few weeks where I'm comfortable. We're going to save it till then. (laughs) Yeah, we're going to save it till then. So now it's just, you know, being extremely selective about who we see and and what we do. And we're really keeping it to close family and friends. I mean, I hadn't seen my family. CJ hasn't seen my side of the family in 11 months. Yeah, It's almost a year. A and that's time. a big chunk of his little life. So, you know, it was a risk, but I found out the night before we were flying up and I was able to surprise, you know, my family in person and even Corey, my husband didn't have any idea. So it was, it was such like a, a lot good of surprise tears. video. It was so good. It was my husband and my mom have the same birthday. So I wrapped up um, two pregnancy tests for him and it was just like tears and it was just so good. Um, So yeah, so here we are just afraid to go anywhere. So how do you have those conversations though? So you find out you're pregnant, you're around family and you're traveling. How do you have those like, don't touch me or this is what I'm able to do or What are your like boundaries that you're putting in place for yourself? So Corey and I are, you know, we had to kind of work through that too. And and I think just to kind of triangle this is my sister-in-law just had a baby as well. And, you know, the family dynamic of trying to figure out, is it okay to see the baby? Can we see the baby? How do we see the baby? How do we not add pressure to your life if this isn't the time where you're comfortable right now? So, you know, that was a whole dialogue in and of itself because it's like, you just had a woman who stayed literally inside for nine months of her pregnancy during the height of all this, the stress, the anxiety, she gets the baby out safely into the world. And then, you know, people come in or fly in and want to touch, God forbid something happens. Mm -hmm. So respecting that boundary, you know, of course we want to snuggle and see the baby, but we masked it outside. That was an honor to just be able to see him in person. And when this all passes, like, this will pass, we'll be together. But, you know, navigating it with your partner can be hard too, because sometimes they have different, you know, boundaries set in place. So for us, you know, because Corey was, you know, we have some things coming up and he's like, well, what do I say to this family member? And like, we have three nieces that we adore and put their back in school. So how do you navigate that? And I think it is a case by case basis. And having, having the hard part is having family that respects those boundaries you know, and doesn't take offense to it. I think that's the hardest, you know, place to navigate. Thankfully, we have wonderful family on both sides, but it definitely can be a touchy subject. Yeah. And how's it working right now with like visiting doctors and stuff? Are they doing online appointments? Are you going in person? How does it work now? Both. So we're still only one person (laughs) at the doctor, the pregnant mama. So that's, you know, it is sad because if this is our last baby, like, you know, we don't have those moments. So my heart just goes out to those first time moms who just, you know, this, this real experience was taken from them. Um, but thankful for, um, you know, technology, we're going to be able to go to our appointment on Wednesday over zoom and Corey and I can both be there. And then, you know, we can FaceTime or whatever in the, in the sonogram room. It's definitely not the same, but, um, you know, we have to do what we have to do. It's, it's definitely an isolating experience, but I think that also comes back to, are you at the right practice for you? Like when I go to Serene Health in Fort Lauderdale, like I, w- I walk in and it's like the front office, yeah, Taylor, how are you? How CJ? Like they just could not be, they were so happy to see me back. And like, yeah. there's no coldness and it's all women and it's all different races of women. And it's just like, you go in there and you're like, okay, this is home. This is what the type of care that I want. Because we've all been to, you know, I've been to other OBs where it's like, they're cold and they're, you know, they don't, it's very medicinal. So I think shopping around for a doctor and a practice that makes you feel, I guess, the warm and fuzzies is really important during this time. And also knowing 
um, to me, a low C-section rate was very important. Yeah. Especially in South Florida, because um, mm. doctors, the business of baby is something that is very, very important to know about, but not talked about. Yeah. And, you know, there's a reason why many babies are born nine to five, Monday to Friday. Um, and I think that, again, knowledge is power and just getting to know your options and being able to walk into an office amidst a pandemic where you still feel like you're coming home should be a priority for you. I love that you spoke about that, about you should know the C-section rates at the mm -hmm. hospital that you're going to deliver in. Um, mm -hmm. It is absolutely true that that nine to five, um, there are reasons why mothers are pushed into C-sections. It is not always mm -hmm. because your baby needs to come out. Um, mm -hmm. There are reasons why they are trying to get you to deliver with a certain doctor. There are reasons why they're trying to get to you by the end of a shift. I mean, and, and to have those sorts of stats, to know how quickly your hospital will say, I think we need to get you into a C-section. Um, it's why you have an advocate with you, but knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. And if you can sit mm -hmm. there and say no, or it can help you make a decision that this is not the hospital for you, because yeah. you know that their fallback is to push you into that sort of decision. Mm -hmm. um, and for those who wish to have that on their own, we're not talking about those mothers. We're talking about mothers who are told, you need to have this now when there are very likely chances that you do not. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yes, thank you for touching on that. Figure out stats like that about where you're mm -hmm. going to deliver. And they're accessible and they, you know, they will be honest with you. You just have to ask the questions. Yeah. You just have to ask. That is it. Is mm -hmm. that, and you have to know to ask, which is why I think these conversations are important yep. because people like Taylor tell you, mm -hmm. you need to ask. <laughs> so you're home, you're pregnant, you have a toddler, you're mm -hmm. a wife. What do you think for mothers right now, for wives right now, for these for people who are managing all of this, what is this like for you during a pandemic and during all of the unrest that's happening in the world right now? It's hard. I think, you know, you and I have had countless conversations about the cultural unrest that is taking place in our country. And I think as women of color, especially women of color in the wellness space, we're feelers and, you know, taking on, you know, you're, you're reading these comments on social and, and it's, it's a lot, it's heavy. It's you're married to a black man. I'm married to a white man with two completely different experiences. And, you know, it, it, that alone is, will take you to bed. You know, it's like, you just want to take to bed. Now add to that a pandemic, a toddler, um, <laughs> you know, so many other things. I, I mean, I, I get overwhelmed a lot of days. Um, I have to be okay. And I've, I've been okay with crawling into bed, you know, setting boundaries with my partner, say, Hey, you're done at five 30. He says, I got this from five to seven 30. I got dinner. I got, you know, there, but there's been a lot of work, I think in our relationship amidst COVID, like mm. things that we just weren't doing before that have been total game changers. And thankfully to help us navigate this, I think open lines of communication, like we have our mind strong time now that we call uh, that's from like five to six 30 in the morning, where it's our time to connect, have coffee, um, you know, read a, few, a chapter from a book or something like that, and then t talk about it. And that's really helped our connection and, and help us, okay, then we sit back and we look at our schedules for the day and we find pockets for each other. Okay, I have an hour here, he could take CJ, I can get my work done. So it's just really navigating and attacking in a different way, which I think is just going to make us so, a so much more powerful couple and family when we get out of this time. Mm -hmm. um, so really, I think, on the flip side of all of this chaos and negative energy, there is beauty in this time if we peel back the layers. So I think it's finding ways to focus. You have time to spend with your baby now. Yeah. Like you have time. And that is such a gift that we didn't have before this. It's okay to live in your bubble, have your groceries delivered, you know, do things that we're not going to have for very long and just try your best to to kind of mitigate the anxiety and the extra layers. You know, for me, it's like, I have so much work to get done, but yesterday I was just like, you know what I need? I need to get in bed yeah. and I need to watch Black is King and I need to take a nap. And that's what I did. And I had to be okay with it. And it's so not like me, but I felt so much better after I did. Hmm. What else are you doing 
let's talk about women in self-care right now. Like, yeah. so tips on things that women can be doing, mothers, wives, yep. partners, mm -hmm. um, people who identify as women, what, how are we taking care of ourselves in this moment? I think carving out the time and like moving your body. I think it, it, people laugh at like, you know, it's not about dieting. It's not about, you know, doing the hardest workout, but I think finding a way to move your body in a way that feels good for you and, and making healthy food choices affects your mental well being on a level that many people just don't understand, you know, mm. because what are a lot of us doing? We're stress eating, we're going for the, the chocolate and we're going for, you know, I mean, all of the things that make us feel better momentarily, but what is that doing for us long-term? So just finding a way to move your body and there's so much access now. Um, you know, I run a program on this, on this uh, program called Ladder Teams and it's just been a great community to just really connect. Even though it's through a screen, you really feel like you have community support. Use YouTube, go out for a walk. I think turn your phone off. Do not make it the first thing you pick up the second you open your eyes, because what does that lead to? That negative energy that just feeds our system all day long. So taking those breaks, we shut down between five and seven every night. So that's been something that's happened amidst COVID too. It's like family time. That's it. Dinner, bath time. Um, it sounds silly, but we, we found our faith during COVID too. Um, silly. And in a way, in a way that it's more value driven. And, you know, to, I could like get emotional thinking about it, but two weeks in all of a sudden we were sitting down at the table and CJ reaches his hands out to pray now. So it's like those silver linings that you're like, Oh my, how did I miss this before? Hmm. You know, and just finding the beauty and the simplicity and letting go of the comparison too, and setting that happiness plan. I think it's such a way to kind of peel back the layers and find the simplicity in your life and say, okay, what's going to make me happy? Maybe it's in this moment, maybe it's a month from now, but what do I have to do to feel happy? Cause it's, it's not, it doesn't come easy. I love you so much, Taylor. I love I'm sitting you. here trying not to cry. <laughs> I just really, I love your spirit. I think that you know, you are such a light for women in this world. And yeah. um, I think like one of the things I just, I've always loved about you is understanding that we are not supposed to be good. I don't know why I'm still crying. But... <laughs> I love you. No, I am pregnant right now. <laughs> I have no excuse. You're pregnant. Why am I crying? No, um, I'm not. <laughs> right? It's like, now I'm sweating. Um, is I think recognizing that we're not supposed to be good at these things, right? It's like, no one is expecting that during a pandemic, you're supposed to know how to take care of yourself, or you're supposed to know how to show up as a mom or how to show up as a partner and how important it is to say like, I need to put a plan into place. I need to sit down and ask for help. I need to turn to other women and, and say like, how can we help each other and, and and be put in action steps because little baby steps are what get you to joy and what get you yeah. to, to to faith and what get you to look at being able to look down at your baby and see him put his little hands out and i'm just picturing yeah. you giving birth to him <laughs> and the fact that he does that is just so cute it's amazing and like he came in yesterday and said hi mom and forget it it was just like you that's know, it you go, that's but it it's this that, time it and is. that is it it's is. like you know, this pandemic, it's like, yes, we know it's scary, right? It is like the reality of what is happening is not lost on any of us, but no, I do think like what I hope through this podcast, through this audience is that we do look at this as a reset and that we mm -hmm. do look at this as a chance to be like, what wasn't working before? Like yep. stop trying to return to life, like create a new life, design yes. a new one, like figure out what feels good to you and make space for, for happiness. And yeah. I mean, I just got chills everywhere because it's, just, I think we, we just got lost. Yeah. I think we all got lost and I see it. I mean, the, it's, it's like the light just kind of came back to our little family and to see CJ's connection to his dad now is like, 
light years ahead of where it was even, you know, eight months ago. Yeah. Um, and that's the age where things transition, but it's, it's just, there's something bigger than us happening. And yeah, it's like taking the baby steps every day. And, you know, uh, one other thing that I just want to mention before we close is early in the pandemic, we literally like Corey and I sat down and we wrote out our values, our top five, six values for me, he wrote them out for him. And then we compared and wrote our family values. And then from there, we wrote out our short-term needs and our long-term needs. Like, what do we need right now? Again, to feel happy. So it's like a planning place, but it's also, okay, how are we going to feed our values every day? And what do we need to get there? And what do we need to do so that we're here a year from now? And it was just like, and we hung them on our closet door. So every day we looked at them and it just, now not a day ago now it feels like habit it's just like okay this is what we're gonna do we pray every night at the table we make these food choices we work out together every day like it's just I feel like I'm living a different life and it's it's beautiful amidst all this chaos but it needs to be cultivated it's not a like on social media it's cultivation and daily effort I love you. I love your family. I love you more. I love you I guys love you. so much. Can you tell our audience where they can find you, your social media, your websites, your projects? Where can people locate you? Yeah, absolutely. So if you want to work with someone in nutrition and fitness, um, my program is Mind Body Burn on the Ladder Team app. So we focus on strength, cardiovascular health. We also do a mindfulness moving meditation on Sundays. It's a great community support. Um, so that app is called Ladder Teams. You can try it for free seven days. I'm on Instagram, Taylor Walker Fit, and then my blog, taylorwalkerfit.com, um, healthy recipes, lifestyle, um, and also opportunities for live Zoom workouts. And may I please tell you, I've watched this woman teach live and <laughs> it's exhausting. Like she is phenomenal at what she does. Um, Can I tell you what it really embarrassed? Thank you, what? thank you. But my last class that I ever took with you, I was like nine months old. Oh, yeah. You made me do some pose. I peed my pants. I had to thank gosh i had dark pants on because i was like did this just happen training the pelvic floor <laughs> you might pee in class but it will work it works. <laughs> so i'm that's so my embarrassing story i love i'm you. so happy i was able to lead you through that Thank you so much for coming and for sharing time with me and with our audience and for announcing your amazing news. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, I love you so much. Thank you. I love you too. And we will talk soon. And to the Collective okay. Reset audience, thank you for joining me and Taylor and have a great day. Love you. Love you, honey.